Hi, so these things, they truly are a modern miracle, hey? The neodymium magnets, now they only came into existence in 1982, but since that time, of course, they dominate. If you think about it, the use of these things is all over the place, but particularly for our interest in motors and generators. Motors and generators rely heavily on the magnetic field strength. So the stronger you can get that magnetic field, the more you can generate per weight of magnets. And that's a really important issue. Now, magnets have been around, oh, I mean, donkey's years, hey, from the very first compasses. To make a magnet way back when, what you really did was take a bit of iron and hit it with a hammer and it would become magically magnetized. Somebody discovered that if you did this in electrical field, then the magnetization was easier and the magnet was stronger and it was kept a huge secret. The companies who made magnets would make their various bars of iron and take them to a secret room where the magnetizer, who had no contact with anybody else who worked in that factory, would busily beat them in an electrical field until the magnets were magically produced. So they've always had this air of mystery. How did they actually operate at a distance with nothing in between them and how were they made? Now it was in 1916 when they replaced iron with steel and steel became the predominant material for making magnets from about that time on. But it was in 1930 when the first ferrite magnets were produced and they were quickly followed by Alnico magnets in 1931. Alnico is a alloy, aluminium, nickel and cobalt, which is where the name comes from and you could make much stronger magnets with that, but they had a problem and we'll talk about that problem in a minute. Samarium cobalt magnets, which were the next step in magnet development, came in 1965 and were followed again in 1982 by these things. Now, any magnet has three properties of great interest to anybody. The first one, of course, is the uh, magnetic field strength. They have a, a point called saturation. So you, to magnetise these, you essentially put them in a magnetic field created by an electromagnet. These will saturate, that is, get their strongest magnetic field, irrespective, really, of the strength of the electromagnetic field. Well, if it's too low, they obviously won't get as strong as they can. But it reaches a point at which this saturates, then if you make that field any stronger, it doesn't really matter. This won't get any stronger as a magnet. So there's a point at which saturation can occur. And obviously, if we can get a material that has a higher saturation, then we would have a much stronger magnet. There's also a property called coercivity. If you put these in a motor or a generator, of course, what you're doing with them is using an electromagnet to apply another magnetic field to it to push it away. Coercivity is that self-discharge, if you like, the self-removal of the magnetism when it's exposed to another magnetic field. And that was the problem with Alnico. Alnico has a very low coercivity. You can use them for permanent magnetic switching, actually, uh, and they're very cool when they're done in things like um, switch reluctance motors and magnetic chucks. They use Alnico magnets for exactly that reason. The third property that they have to have really is temperature dependent because these will lose their magnetism if taken above a certain temperature. That temperature is called the Curie point. All magnets do it and they have a different temperature at which they will do that. But there is a drop off in the magnetic strength as temperature goes up. So in order to be stable under temperature with these things, with neodymium, they add um, dispro dysprosium to it. The problem with dysprosium and indeed neodymium, of course, is they're rare earth materials and very expensive. Dysprosium is actually uh, a tiny amount in here, and yet the overall cost of dysprosium is four times the cost of the neodymium that goes into these things. So they're actually incredibly expensive. They're about $120 per kilo of magnet, which is not, not that cheap. And of course, it's gone up dramatically over the last few years. It's seen a tenfold increase in the price. There are other issues with it, of course, and that is availability, because predominantly these things are produced by China. And that's been an economic leverage of China for many years, and it makes the supply of them a little unstable and a little difficult to um, protect, really. 
Now, when people first started using more powerful magnets like the ferrites, ferrite magnets can be magnetized relatively easily in situ. It's, it's not more very complicated to actually surround them with the field that they need to turn them into useful magnets. These things, however, can't. You need special fixtures and special machines to actually magnetize these. And those machines and fixtures are terribly expensive, so the standard approach with these things is to buy them pre-magnetized. You buy them like this, that are already a magnet, and then you have to form the thing around the shape or slug that you can buy. And of course, the more powerful you buy that, then putting them in place is really quite scary and difficult because they're extremely powerful and crushing injury is one of the real hazards with this when you're trying to make a motor or a generator yourself because they will just zap to the steel and if your fingers in between could buy your fingers. So not being able to magnetize them in a, an effective and cheap way actually it is quite a huge problem. So there's a, a well-recognized list of problems with these things. And of course, there's also a wish list. I mean, wouldn't it be great if it didn't use any rare earths, if it was much cheaper to make, if you could get the, the magnetic power in there more strongly so that we could have cheaper, lighter, easier to use. Exactly. That, that wonderful material, if only it existed, that I just outlined, exists. It's been known about since 1951 when a guy called Jack stumbled over it and made a note about it and its wonderful magnetic properties. And that material is our nitride. It's Fe16N2 actually, a specific form. And that's what he discovered in 1951. But nobody was interested. And so it just remained a note. Of course, great interest resurged on magnets and magnetic materials and people did the research and found what Jack was doing, even though it had been sort of lost and hidden for many, many years. Found what he was doing, and one group replicated it, but nobody else could. And so there was a huge surge of interest, but when they couldn't actually replicate it, they said, oh no, that's a load of rubbish, and it died at death again. Until a group from Minnesota University said to themselves, hang on, what exactly was going wrong here, and maybe people aren't being as particularly good as they should be. And they decided to have a look at it. It took them 10 years to work it out. The problem with our nitride is it's a little hit and miss to actually produce. You can produce it, but you're lucky if you do. And that was the issue. They produced it, luckily, and nobody else could. So Minnesota embarked on a research program of fundamental research to find out how exactly you could make this our nitride type stably and repeatedly, repeatedly. And they came across three main methods. In order to actually reproduce what he was doing, what they took was uh, a sheet of very clean iron, sent it off to Los Alamos, and had nitrogen irons fired at it in a specific ratio. And hey, presto, they produced the material. Because that's not very useful when you want to make magnets, so the rest of the time, was spent in researching how they could produce the book material. And oddly enough, it turns out it was actually surprisingly simple. Now, I'm a fan of something called mechanochemical synthesis. What it is, is you're making chemicals, but by using a mechanical action. And an example of that is ball milling. You get yourself a tub, you fill it full of steel balls, you put your materials in there, and you tumble it around slowly for a few days. And reactions will happen because these materials smash into each other. Turns out, if you put iron powder and ammonium nitrate together and tumble it for a couple of days, you get exactly the right kind of iron nitride out. They also worked on another method where they're using um, iron sheets, but this time they oxidized the iron and then they put it under a stream of ammonia because the oxide is slightly uh, acidic and the ammonia is alkali and it would react and you would just get the nitrogen medium planted into the iron and so they could make sheets and um, wires out of this stuff or they could make powders for sintering it and of course they started a company. The company they set up is Nyron Magnetics and they've chosen two of the most abundant materials. Iron of course is the fourth most abundant element and something like 5% of the Earth's crust and because nitrogen is 70% of the atmosphere and we don't know what else to do with it so it's freely and abundantly available and of course the expectation is the costs are going to plummet. Now their generation one magnets are due out 
later this year in 2022. And the Generation 2 magnets are due out in 2023. So these new magnets are going to be on the market really quite soon. And what's the advantage of them? Well, they have their own peculiarities, of course. Their coercivity is actually lower than near, uh, near dimium at room temperature. But at the operating temperature of a generator or a motor, it's about the same. They also have a higher saturation and the ability to withstand temperature is much more improved. So they've done motors out of it already, showing that for a 30% reduction in the amount of magnets and an overall 10 to 15% reduction in the weight of the motor, they can get two and a half to three times the power out of a motor per cost of magnet per kilogram, which is amazing if you think about it. Because remember, motors and generators are just the opposite of each other. So if a motor performs that way, a generator is going to perform exactly the same way. So the generator for your cost per magnet is likely to be able to produce two and a half to three times the amount of energy that a generator can currently produce. That, of course, is extremely exciting to everybody, me included. Now, one issue I mentioned earlier was this ease of magnetization, particularly for a homemaker. If you're buying powerful magnets, they're difficult to handle. But if you buy iron nitride unmagnetized, it's like handling a lump of anything, very simple to actually handle. And then they can be magnetized in situ really quite easily. The ease of construction of the generator that you're looking to build is also going to be vastly improved. Not only are we going to get more power out of these things, they're going to be easier to actually make your own DIY generators. So I thought I would share that all with you because they are due out this year. And I thought it was extremely exciting. Keep an eye out for them. Let's see what they're like. And hopefully we can be using them in our own generators later this year or next year. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.